So it's a big pleasure to introduce uh, Graham Taylor from uh, the University of Guelph in Canada. So uh, Graham is a, a CIFAR Azraeli Global Scholar, as John was just talking about. Um, he's also the academic director of Next AI, uh, which is, seems to be an investment fund uh, for AI, not nonprofit, non even better, for AI startups. Um, he's also a member of the now famous uh, Vector Institute uh, in Canada um, for deep learning and machine learning and AI. Um, so I think uh, his research is best characterized as developing new machine learning and deep learning methods and applying them to a broad range of very interesting topics um, such as uh, human and animal behavior, um, environmental data such as climate data, audio and medical informatics. Um, and I remember to just discuss a few of his papers. Um, I remember his uh, work with Jeff Hinton and Sam Rowais on smoothly moving stick figures. It was a lot of fun to look at, um, basically using RBMs to make uh, build models of motion. Um, he's also a co-author on uh, deconvolutional uh, networks, which are of great interest also to this field, as well as uh, some interesting uh, work on generative modeling for data augmentation um, that could also be very interested for, uh, interesting for uh, this field. So um, let me thank Graham for coming here and give a talk. Okay, thank you very much for the warm welcome and the introduction, Max. It's a pleasure to be here in a beautiful city and also at a conference that has uh, 50 posters instead of 1,000 posters, like many uh, machine learning and AI conferences these days. So it's a real treat to be able to get up and ask some questions and be close to the poster and not be sort of 10 people back. So uh, I'm going to be talking about methods for learning confidence today. And I'm going to start with um, oh, first acknowledging that uh, the, a lot of this work has been done by Terence DeVries, who's a PhD student of mine. And uh, the work that I will talk about is on archive. And I just put up, uh, last night got the URL from Terence on an, an, an archive paper for sort of the second part of this work. So really the work will cover two papers that are available uh, if you want to check out the details afterwards. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start by talking about deep learning or machine learning models in general, which are becoming uh, increasingly, eff increasingly effective at making predictions. But often they will fail, and they'll fail spectacularly, and they'll fail silently. And so one example that tends to get highlighted by the media is every time an autonomous vehicle has a crash, the media makes a big deal about it, uh, even though there's more than a million road accidents uh, every year. But this is an example where N a machine knowing what it knows is really important because these vehicles, when they're, when they're uncertain about a particular situation, they can hand back control to a person. Okay, so there's going to be a couple things I'm talking about today. One is systems, which have already have a human in the loop. And you can estimate some conf confidence from the input data the system is receiving and give that to either a person or another system for, for further inspection. Or is, the other, is, is this case, basically, when you can estimate some confidence or uncertainty and basically decide that it's time to hand it back to a human. And so I'll talk about this sort of in, in the general machine learning sense, but then I'll go on to talk about it more in the medical imaging context. What I'd like to show you next is a startup, uh, Kindred, which I co-founded in, in 2014. And this company is creating robots currently for the e-commerce industry. So these robots are deployed in uh, warehouses, e-commerce warehouses right now. This is a robot you're seeing that's in, in a Gap warehouse, the, the clothing retailer. And this robot is uh, essentially running a, a, a robot as a service. So Gap pays per, plick, per uh, pick. And this robot picks up poly bags. Uh, it scans their UPC codes, and it sorts them into cubbies. So the idea is essentially to receive orders in the facility and sort them so a person can go on the other side of the cubby and take out the orders and, and send them off to the, to the person who's purchased the clothing. And the interesting thing about this system is it's autonomous, but it's only semi-autonomous. So 80% of the time, it's working completely autonomously. But 20% of the time, it has to call in a human for help. So say it picks up two of these poly bags at the same time, or it can't scan their UPC code. 
this is what happens. So you see a person who's logging in through the Kindred interface. This person's actually sitting in Toronto, and the robot is in somewhere in Tennessee. And so using an interface, the human steps in. It takes over the robot. It teleoperates it out of the, the problem that it's currently in, sorts the item of clothing, and then returns control back to the robot. And all that data is saved, and we use algorithms like reinforcement learning, and in this case, imitation learning, to actually make the system better so it's going to be greater than 80% autonomous in the future. And in this case, you have maybe one person uh, controlling 10 or 20 robots instead of one person per robot. So in general, I'm going to talk about systems that produce not just a prediction, but also an estimate of the confidence about the input that's coming into the system. So it's, it's just like any other deep learning system you might be familiar with, but essentially has two outputs that it's giving you, the, the prediction and the confidence. So I'm not going to talk about robotics. I'm sure that Kindred doesn't want me sort of publicly re revealing their, their trade secrets. But I'm going to talk about two problems that are very important in machine learning. One is out of distribution detection. So this is the idea of training a system with a particular data set, for example, CIFAR 10. This is an Im image classification data set. And then at test time, when you're trying to make predictions, you're going to estimate whether the input that you're seeing either comes from the distribution that it was, the model was trained on, so CIFAR, or if it comes from a different data set that is essentially resized uh, to look like the, the original data. Okay, so we'll use data sets like TinyImageNet, LSUN, and ISUN, which have reasonably similar distributions to CIFAR 10. And the idea is to use this confidence measure that we're producing to separate these different types of data, which we'll call in distribution or out of distribution. So namely, did I see an example like this before? Or is this something that's unusual that I've never seen before? So going back to the autonomous vehicle example, it's like you might drive that car and, and train it in, in, in the United States, and then you might bring it up to Canada and start driving in some snowy conditions that it's never experienced before. And you want to know, is this is the scene that you're seeing significantly different than what you've encountered before? And therefore, maybe it's time to pass control back to a human. Okay, so this is what you're seeing up here. We're using this confidence score, that's the number between 0 and 1, output by the system, and we're plotting its histograms for both the uh, in-distribution data over here and the out-of-distribution data. So you'll see that the in-distribution data, sh we're expecting it to have a higher confidence in general than the uh, out-of-distribution data. And that's what we'll use to, to separate out this data. The other example that I'm going to show on the medical imaging side is this uh, idea of detecting misclassified examples. So here, at an image level, you're going to try, try to make a prediction of whether your model has made a, a good or, or a bad prediction. So in this case, we're looking at medical image segmentation, in particular skin lesion segmentation. So we have the input, we have the ground truth, so the correct prediction, and then our model's prediction. And we're going to see, in this case, our model matches the ground truth. Uh, in this case, we also match the ground truth. So in these cases, these are good predictions. In this case, we've done a segmentation. It's a very poor segmentation. doesn't match the ground truth. So in this case, we want the model to make a prediction that it's actually made a mistake. And in this case, we might hand it off to a human for further inspection, such as a clinician. OK, so the, the, the high-level objectives of this work are effectively to engineer a, a, a system that can modify any general type of deep learning uh, network and in a relatively intuitive and simple way. We can accept sort of any architecture we want. We don't have to drastically change the training procedure or the architecture. But it also produces intuitively interpretable uh, output. So there's been many confidence measures proposed, but they don't necessarily have a, a value that's calibrated. So that's what we'd like to aim for. And also, it doesn't require any additional labels at training time. So s explicitly, we don't have to go out and ask somebody to to label some easy examples and hard examples. That's something that's called curriculum learning. And we also don't have to have any in-distribution versus out-of-distribution examples to train the system. And I'll show you how to do that a later, later, little bit later on. So before getting into the details of our system, I'd just like to go through a little bit of the background and, and, and discuss the baselines that we're comparing to. So there's a, a, a simple uh, solution proposed last year by Hendricks and Gempel that just looks at the maximum softmax probability. So classifiers that are used in deep learning typically use an output 
a type of output unit that's called a, a softmax, and this expresses the probability of that input being assigned to any particular class. And if you look at the statistics of that uh, output distribution, it tends to be that in distribution examples have a higher maximum softmax probability than output distribution example or out of distribution examples. And this is also this, the, true for misclassified and, 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 cla and, and correctly classified examples. So correctly classified examples tend to have a greater maximum softmax probability distribution than incorrectly classified examples. Not every single example has this property, but on the aggregate, you can threshold this maximum softmax probability and use this to separate the in distribution from the out of distribution or the misclassified from the correctly classified examples. Now the thing with softmax probabilities is that they don't really provide a calibrated measure of confidence. So they're not really human interpretable. And uh, although their statistics can be used to, again, separate these, t these distributions. So I'm going to quickly detour into an area called adversarial examples. Hands up if you've heard about er adversarial examples so far? Okay, the majority of the room, that's what I was expecting. So I'm going to have a couple slides on this because I have to introduce a little bit of machinery that comes from this literature. So this is the idea that you might have a, a, a classification system that's predicting uh, correct classification. So in this case, I show a school bus and I have a deep network and it puts the majority of probability on the, the bus label and that's, that's, uh, that's true. But then we come along and we add a, 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 a specifically chosen and, and small amount of noise to the image, image. So we just perturb it ever so slightly. And this, uh, this image has actually been enhanced to, uh, to, sh to show the noise. It's actually much smaller than this, such that when we add this noise to the image, it's imperceptible that, uh, that, that anything has changed, right? So it just looks like the original image, but when we give that image to the network, the network suddenly changes its prediction to a different label. And so in some cases, we can actually control the label that we wish to change to. So in this case, we might want the network to output ostrich for school buses for whatever reason. And so in that case, we typically use what's called an iterative system, where we iteratively update the input, or the, the noise that we're adding to the input, to cause it to generate an image that can attack the model. But there's other types of these uh, attacks that fall into a different class, and these are assess essentially sy systems that are one-shot attacks. So we just add a single uh, noise vector to the image, and with that noise vector, we're able to change the label. In this case, we typically don't have control over what we want the label to be, but we can effectively add noise such that we move the uh, prediction away from the correct label towards a different label. And that's how the attack is built. And so the reason that I've detoured into adversarial examples is that I want to talk about this one particular method, uh, the fast gradient sign method proposed by uh, Ian Goodfellow in, in 2014. They use a particular type of um, update, oh, my, can you advance the slide? It's not working for me. There we go. Okay, so they add uh, a particular uh, type of noise to the image, and the, this is derived from basically taking the gradient of the output label at the correct class with respect to the input and moving in the opposite direction. So that's this term right here, because this is the, the, the gradient term. Um, so we take basically that output softmax, and we find what the correct label should be, so that's y, given that input. And then we essentially take the sign of that, and this is actually b, should be a negative right here. We move in the opposite direction, okay? So in that case, what we're doing is we're making a change to the input such that it moves away from the correct output. And this is actually pretty cheap. It's just one call to backprop, which is basically double the work than you would be normally doing when you train a network, when you're going forward and, and, and backwards to the net. Okay, so the reason I detoured briefly into adversarial examples was to get that FGSM update. And um, this is used by a technique that was proposed earlier this year, which enhances this Hendricks and Gempel baseline that uses ma maximum softmax probability. So what they add to this, uh, this max softmax probability thresholding are two things. So first, they add uh, a temperature scaling to the outputs, okay? And they've observed that basically with out of distribution, or, uh, uh, on in distribution inputs, the uh, softmax is more sensitive 
Uh, and therefore, by applying this output scaling, tends to separate these distributions more. And the second thing that they do is actually do this small perturbations of the input that is inspired by this FGSM attack, but they go the opposite direction. So they actually find the uh, label that the, um, the, the network is predicting, and they go further in the direction of that label. So instead of walking away from the correct label, they find that maximum softmax probability, and they make an update based on the gradient of that output with respect to the input towards the label that it's predicting. And they found that this has a greater effect, again, for in-distribution examples versus out-of-distribution examples. So this is another way of separating those two distributions. And the final class of, uh, of essentially um, background algorithms I want to present are methods that are derived from Bayesian neural networks. And actually, Max has, Max has worked on this area as well. So there's a number of techniques that uh, model uncertainty in the parameters and therefore also uncertainty in the, in the outputs by adopting a, 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 a fully Bayesian view of neural networks. So they actually maintain a distribution over the parameters of the network instead of basically searching for a single set of parameters that works. Now, the downside about these Bayesian approaches is that inference is relatively slow, even though there have been a number of techniques that have been working towards making it more efficient. But there's a series of techniques that have been developed in the context of uh, confidence and uncertainty, which aim to do approximations to Bayesian neural nets. And the most popular one is something called the Monte Carlo dropout method, um, proposed by Jürgen Gall and Zubin Garamani uh, in 2016. And I imagine many of you are familiar with this dropout method, where you actually, when training a network, you're randomly taking groups of hidden units and removing them from the network. And then at test time, you're actually um, building up theory, like, which is essentially, essentially something that's approximating an ensemble of different networks. Um, the idea of Monte Carlo dropout is to actually do this at test time. So you train a network with dropout, and then you do several passes of your input through the network to get an output. But for each of those passes through the network, you drop out a different selection of random units. And therefore, you get multiple predictions, and you can use those multiple predictions to estimate uncertainty. And there's a number of different methods that take a similar approach. But the downside of this family of techniques is that they require a number of passes through the network. So you have to take 10 or 100 predictions at test time. And obviously, this is, um, this is going to slow your model down, particularly for applications which require, require real-time performance. OK, so that's essentially what we're comparing to, those approaches. Now, I want to get into the details of our, our method. And so I want you to imagine a test-taking scenario. So you're sitting down, you're a university student, you're about to take an exam. And this is a special type of exam where you, you get your paper, you look through it, and you have to answer the questions, but you can also ask for hints, any number of hints on any question. But you pay a penalty for asking for hints. Okay, so each hint that you ask for, you're, you're effectively going to lose some marks. And so an effective strategy in this scenario is to obviously answer questions that you're confident about, the questions that you know the answer to, without asking for any hints. And then you're going to look for questions, which appear tricky to begin with, and you're going to start asking for hints on those questions. And so one way to estimate your confidence for any particular question is simply to count up the number of hints that you ask for, because the number of hints should be inversely proportional to the number of uh, the, the, should the number of hints should be in, in, uh, inversely proportional to the confidence on those particular questions. Okay, so we're going to adopt a similar uh, paradigm for actually teaching a neural network uh, on on particular examples. All right, so this is the most important uh, slide in the entire deck because it, it outlines the method. So you have uh, a neural network. It doesn't really matter. Uh, again, ag architecture agnostic could be a convolutional neural net, could be a fully connected neural net. But the difference between this neural net and any other neural net you've, you've seen is, again, it's not just making a prediction, but it also has this second branch for this confidence score. And the prediction we're going to adopt, we're going to assume classification. Those, this could be extended to other tasks. And in classification, this is going to be our soft max at the output, representing the, the believed probability o over any of the uh, classes that could be classified in this image. And then this confidence is going to be a scalar value between 0 and 1. So that's what I'm showing over here. Both these individual probabilities and the confidence are in 0, 1. And of course, the probabilities have to sum to 1 right here. 
And so what we do with this confidence at training time is we're gonna use this to allow the network to effectively ask for hints. So what we're gonna do and what, what hinting means in this setup is that this would normally be our guess. So it's like when you're the student, you look at the questions and you look at each of these and that's your sort of your, your hunch. You're gonna use your confidence to scale your first guess between the actual true, li true label. So if this is your prediction, you have a distribution over the outputs, this is a one-hot encoding of the ground truth. So in effectively, this class here would represent mountain goat here, and then there would be zero probability on any of the others. And so you scale, your, your, your final prediction is going to be an interpolation between your guess and the ground truth. And so this is going to give you adjusted uh, softmax, and that's going to be basically your final answer. And you're going to use that as your prediction. And so the first thing you might notice when you look at that is you'll probably say to yourself, well, this network's just going to ask for hints all the time because it's going to get the ground truth answer for free. So we've got two terms. We've got a task loss. And then we have what we call this confidence loss. So the task loss is what we would train with when we just train a neural network to do classification. In this case, we're, we're using cross-entropy error. But the, the key thing here is that the cross-entropy error is computed on the final answer, okay, which has been scaled according to the confidence. Okay? And the second term here is this confidence loss, where you effectively pay a price for asking for too many questions. Okay? So that's what keeps you from asking for a question or asking for a, a hint every single time. Okay, so just, I just want to briefly look at the extremes here. So the ex in the extreme that you're 100% confident, so your confidence is 1, that means you just pass through your guess, right? You don't ask for hints at all. In the extreme that your confidence is 0, this term becomes 0, and this term becomes 1, so you're just passing through the ground truth uh, answer. And so you'll be exactly correct, and you'll suffer no task loss, but you'll suffer maximal confidence loss. Okay, so there's this trade-off between... Um, you know, making predictions based on your, your intuition versus asking for hints and this coming from an oracle. So there's a couple implementation, implementation details I need to go through um, that makes the system work. So one of the things you might notice is that, um, oh, sorry, my, okay. The dynamics during learning are such that you'll start with typically a random initialization of your parameters and you'll be doing quite poorly at the beginning of training and then you'll start getting better and better and better and becoming more confident and so forth. And so you don't want to lose this calibrated nature of your uh, confidence mechanism over the course of learning such that you're always 100% confident at the end of learning. And therefore, as a byproduct, you basically effectively learn to ignore certain examples all the time. So you just refuse to ever uh, answer, make an answer for any particular example. You just always ask for hints. So essentially what we do here is that we scale the term, this confidence term in the loss, such that it's always constant. And we control this, basically we, we had this hyperparameter alpha which traded off the confidence loss and the, and the task loss. We basically re re replace this with a different hyperparameter beta which aim, aims at being a target for confidence. So we say keep your confidence constant throughout learning, but scale this lambda. So if your confidence uh, loss term starts getting greater than beta, then you're gonna scale up the lambda so that you're paying more for asking hints. And if your confidence is less than beta, then you're going to decrease this parameter. So it costs, le costs less to ask for hints. And then all you need to do is you set one hyperparameter, which is this beta. And it's actually not super sensitive to the choice of beta anyways. So I'll show you um, some images of this. So this is with a fixed setting of beta equals 0 0.3. And I'm going to show what's happening for a very simple toy two-dimensional data set. So each data put here is uh, an x and y value. And you see these represented by the circles. And we have two classes, white points and black points. This is effectively the XNOR uh, uh, problem. OK, so you've got um, fixed beta. So it, this is a fixed target confidence. So you have a, like a, a fixed amount of confidence you're asking for. And I'm going to show what's happening when you add 
increasing amount of noise to your data. So in the first uh, example here, we don't have any noise in the data, and you can see that this confidence um, is the most confident areas are in dark blue, and the in regions in which your model is uncertain are in the red regions here. So it's actually what you would expect. You have uncertainty along the, dis uh, along the boundaries of the, the data. Okay, so those are the decision boundary here. Um, as you start increasing your noise, the total amount of uh, uncertainty remains constant, but you actually start spreading out your unconfident region, as you see here. So as you add sort of the, the, the maximum amount of noise uh, in this, this is just adding Gaussian noise to the data points, you'll see that your confidence spreads out, but the total amount of confidence or sort of the amount of hints that you're asking for remains constant. So it naturally scales the noise in the data. Oh, can you advance my slide? Oh, okay. Can you advance my slide, please? Okay, perfect. So this is showing essentially what I was just showing is going across the, the rows. And this actually shows what happens when you change this effectively target confidence measure. So you see this sort of uh, amount of uh, hints you're asking for effectively scale up with beta. Um, and then this measure spread out as noise gets added to the data. Okay. And again, the, uh, it, the, this beta measure is a hyperparameter that should be set by cross-validation, but we found is it's not uh, extremely sensitive to any particular choice um, within a reasonable range. Okay, so that's one implementation detail that's, that's important. Um, there's one more that's also important, and this is the idea that you don't want to get into a situation where you're just completely ignoring any particular example through training time. Um, and as you get better and better throughout learning, you essentially re start restricting yourself to a very small subset of points um, that you're actually making predictions for. And so what we do is we just, just use stochastic hinting mechanism where we take a mini batch, we take 50% of the points of that mini batch, we treat them as it was just a normal uh, neural net, and then we take 50 points and we actually allow the network to use uh, confidence with those. So 50%, 50%. And so essentially we're allowing for hints on 50% of any particular batch. And this essentially um, inf enforces that sort of over the course of training, in expectation, the model will have to be making a prediction for every point in the, the training data set. And this is very much like the uh, exploration, st some of the exploration strategies in reinforcement learning, where you're forced to make a random prediction sometime with the hope that you're actually going to make you know, a, a, a meaningful error and get some gradient information from the, from the loss. Okay, so that's the, the way that we change the learning algorithm to, to learn a confidence metric. Let's talk about using it in out of distribution estimation. Okay, so once we've trained up this model, we can make predictions and we can output a confidence. And we want to use this confidence to actually um, separate the out of distribution points from the in distribution points. So we have to come up with some threshold delta and we say if, if the confidence is below this delta, we're going to call it an uh, out of distribution point. And if the confidence is above some delta, we're going to call it an in distribution example. And all of these methods, the baselines I described, as well as this me method, require some kind of threshold to be set. You have to find a reasonable value of, of delta. The other thing we do at test time is we actually borrow this idea that Odin used, and we actually do this scaling, this pre-processing inspired by uh, the, the Odin paper, that essentially does a, a gradient step uh, in the direction of the uh, maximum softmax prediction. So again, this further separates these in-distribution and out-distribution examples. And then in terms of how we measure the ability to, of this model to use confidence to detect out of distribution examples is by a few different metrics. And some of, those, the, some of these essentially are threshold independent, meaning that they're able to sort of integrate overall possible thresholds, these deltas, and some of them are not. So the first one is the false positive rate at 95% true positive rate. So we find the, a particular threshold, delta, that gives us a, a, a true positive rate of 95%, and then we measure the false positive rate at that particular delta. And we, uh, we evaluate the different methods under that metric. We also compute something called detection error, and this is one of these metrics that actually integrates over uh, many possible deltas. So the idea here is you're gonna find what's called the minimum misclassification probability. 
And so there's two terms. The first term, this PN, this means uh, an example that is truly in distribution is called out of distribution by your method. So your confidence score is less than uh, delta, so you're going to call that out of distribution, but it was really an in distribution example. And on the other hand, you have examples that are truly out of distribution, but for that particular example, you, were, you predicted confidence higher than delta, and therefore you called it in distribution. So you've made a mistake. So you can make a mistake in one of these two ways, and then the 0 0.5 here is just saying that we have a equal prior probability that we're going to see an in, a truly in distribution example versus a, versus a truly out of distribution example. And then we basically minimize delta for this particular metric. Okay, so it, again, we're sort of searching for over all the possible deltas to give the minimal uh, misclassification probability. And then we also use the standard metrics, uh, area under the receiver operating characteristic and the area under the uh, precision recall curve, which many of you are likely already familiar with. And these also, uh, ag again, integrate over mul multiple possible deltas. Okay. Oh, perfect. All right. So we've done a, f a large number of experiments here, so I'm going to walk you through this, so the, the key points. First, I'll explain how we do the evaluation. So we look at various architectures. So DenseNet uh, is a state-of-the-art uh, neural network uh, architecture. I think it, it, it won uh, ImageNet a, a, a couple years ago. Uh, there's wide ResNets as well, and then there's VGG, which is also a standard architecture. And then for each of these architectures, we train them for the in-distribution example on either SVHN, Street View House Numbers, or CIFAR-10. And then we have a number of different out-of-distribution data sets, so we see if we can detect out-of-distribution examples from any of these particular data sets, TinyImageNet, LSUN, ISUN, or a larger data set that's formed from all the out of distribution data sets. Okay. So this is done, again, for both uh, in distribution data sets and on the various architectures. And so the first thing we check is how learning with confidence affects the overall performance of the system. So there's really two by byproducts here of learning with confidence. There's one, which is the obvious one. You get at test time this additional prediction, which allows you to get, it gives you a calibrated measure of confidence. But you can also might believe that integrating this sort of hinting system during training might actually change the way that you're learning. So what we want to see is, does this make learning any better or worse? And what we find is it doesn't really change the overall accuracy of your system. So in the case of SVHN, the classification error when you learn with confidence versus the baseline when you don't learn with any confidence, it actually gets a little bit better. And for CIFAR-10, it gets a little bit worse. Okay, so there's not a huge difference. What we find when we measure uh, the ability to predict out-of-distribution examples under these various metrics, FPR detection area and area under the receiver operating char characteristic uh, curve and, and the area under the P PR curves, is that we beat the baseline every time. So we're, we're doing better. The reason why we have two uh, columns for precision recall is it depends what you're predicting. You're the, are, you, are you calling the sort of the, the correct prediction out of distribution, or are you calling it in distribution? And so we actually evaluate under both of these, and this slightly changes the, uh, the metric. And then comparing not to the Hendricks and Gimple baseline, but comparing to ODIN, which uses these additional uh, mechanisms for separating these distributions, again, we do better in every single case at predicting uh, out of distribution examples, except for one particular scenario, which is dense net with SVHN, in which we perform uh, a little bit worse than the ODIN method. OK, can I do, get a time check? Um, five minutes. OK. I'm going to hop ahead to something a little bit more interesting for the audience. Can I get a couple slides advance, please? OK, because I, I, I do want to talk about medical imaging, given, given that we're at a medical imaging conference. OK, so what we've done, so this is just work that's been carried out, like I showed you, on, on out of distribution uh, detection. But the next thing we looked at is actually, can you use these measures to derive a spatial confidence estimate? So not for, for a particular input, don't just produce a, a scalar confidence, 
but actually create something like a confidence map. So we did this in the context of medical uh, 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 skin lesion segmentation, where we have an input image of a, some skin lesion, and the a task here is to actually segment it from the segment it from the background. So we have uh, an encoder decoder style architecture. We actually use a unit, um, and then we make a segmentation prediction, which is per pixel. But then we produce confidence per pixel. So it's just a fairly simple extension of the method that I described to you earlier, where we're just applying this sort of hinting strategy on every a uh, single output which corresponds to a segmentation of the pixel. But we go, th so that's useful actually being able to show an observer, human the loop, a confidence estimate saying where we're most confident in terms of our segmentation. You can see in this example too, the, the region that we're, we're not confident or uncertain about is essentially around the segmentation boundary. So that's intuitive. <laughs> But we go beyond that, and we actually use our segmentation along with the spatial confidence uh, to estimate a final quality of that segmentation. So this is a scalar value, which is essentially a prediction of its intersection over union. And we give this value here, v, to uh, a, a human or an observer, or we can threshold this to say, this is the overall quality of the segmentation. Images below this quality maybe get passed off to a clinician for, for further review. Okay, so here's another uh, visual example of the type of thing we're predicting. So again, we've got an input, and, ex and this is our, the method I just described, this learned confidence estimates, but we also compare various measures of estimating spatial confidence with it. So we've got the, the maximum probability method, which I described, MC dropout I also described, um, and HCNN, which I haven't really described, but this model is a different type of uh, uncertainty. It's essentially uncertainty associated with the data, so they call it aleatoric uncertainty instead of uncertainty associated with the model, and then our method. And so for each of these methods, if you, you train a network using these various types of confidence measures, you can make a prediction, which might be sl slightly different between the different methods, and then you also get um, a confidence estimate. And so the only one that really changes uh, a, a drastic amount is actually this HCNN method, because the, m the other methods actually ma ma model a, a mixture of epistemic uncertainty, the uncertainty associated with the model, and aleatoric uncertainty, which is uncertainty associated with the data, whereas HCNN really just goes after this aleatoric uncertainty. Okay, so the main... Oh. Okay, so the, the, the main finding here is that compared to methods that try to predict the quality of the segmentation, so in, in this setup we've actually uh, aimed to predict the intersection of the union, or the Jacquard score, of the segmentation. There's methods that have been proposed that um, attempt to do this, that are, are essentially baselines. There's the idea of not using any confidence measure at all, so basically just taking your input, your model's segmentation, and then trying to predict the quality of the overall segmentation from that. And then there's the use of various types of spatial confidence estimates. So now your model gets three inputs. It gets the original image, the segmentation coming out of your model, and the spatial confidence, and using those to make the prediction about overall uh, quality of the segmentation. The methods that use spatial confidence improve the ability to estimate overall image level quality. And actually, there's not a huge difference between uh, maximum uh, soft max probability or MC dropout or our uh, learned confidence estimates. Again, the only method that tends to fail in this scenario for esti estimating confidence is these, these HCNN methods. And so what we see here, this is just basically plotting the true Jacquard index or the quality of the segmentation versus the estimated one. They tend to be uh, well correlated. And examples where we're actually predicting a, a very high a Jacquard index when it's actually uh, quite poor is actually mislabeled examples. It tends to appear, so this is the ground truth, and it's actually a really poor ground truth estimate. That's the actually predicted confidence. So the model actually knows it's making a, critic, a correct prediction. It's just bad ground truth. And again, same with this example here and this example over here. The model is actually making a reasonable segmentation, but um, the ground truth is actually pretty horrible in those cases. Okay, so in, in conclusion, I've shown you an, a reasonably intuitive and simple method of estimating confidence explicitly that can be added to any uh, particular DNN setup. 
And I've shown you uh, how it can be used for out of distribution detection, and also very briefly on sort of image level quality in a medical image segmentation setup. So there's a couple things we want to do beyond this. First is one, go beyond uh, classification. And finally, I'm really, really interested in uh, knowing more about the effect of learning confidence on the learning procedure itself. So we showed that essentially learning with confidence doesn't really change the accuracy too much, but certainly confidence and our, our way to estimate confidence and, and, and reason about our past experiences affects the way that we actually do learning. So we'd, I, I'm, I'm certainly interested in investigating more the dynamics between confidence and the ability to, to learn and predict. Thanks very much. All right, so I uh, thank you for a great talk. I actually propose that you call the smallest possible unit of a hint a hinton. That would be great. And <laughs> Genius. That's, yeah. I like that a lot. Um, so there is some time for questions. Um, yeah, question there. And, uh, I, you know, the, our lovely uh, assistant will bring you the mic. Hello, um, good morning. Um, just very quickly, so you were showing all of these networks that predict the per pixel uh, output and then the, the confidence, and then after that you have this other network that predicts the global one uh, yes. over the full image. When you go into the three-dimensional domain, when images are to the power of three, or when you have 256 cubes, um, it's very hard to fit, uh, for example, the semantic segmentation network fully in memory of GPU, so you normally partition it in patches, and you end up with per patch outputs, which you aggregate back into volumes which makes these kinds of networks not really feasible to be trained end-to-end -end because you don't actually have access to the full output of the full image so that you can train both systems end-to-end. -end. Do you have any suggestions how you would extend it to, let's say, 512 cubes? Because that definitely will not fit the GPU. Right, so, okay, so the question is around when you go from 2D to 3D segmentation and you run into the difficulty of actually fitting into memory, not just the input, but the, usually it's the feature maps that get derived because they have more channels than the, the input. I, I mean, the, the simplest answer is that any of the existing techniques for, um, this is really not a question about sort of confidence, but it's around sort of uh, Im improving the efficiency of 3D image segmentation. So I mean, any of the particular network architectures that have been proposed lately, like there's one by Jimmy Baugh at University of Toronto, um, the, it's like the re reversible uh, RevNet architecture. These particular architectures are uh, engineered to be memory efficient. So um, essentially the idea is to make, so when you do a, f a, a, a forward pass through the network, you end up saving around these feature maps that are computed uh, in memory and able to, to be able to use those to do a backwards pass. And they actually change, they, they make, a, to sort of describe it as a high level, a network architecture that's invertible, so you can actually uh, regenerate those forward feature maps basically when you're doing backprop. Um, uh, so you don't have to actually m keep them around in memory. So, I mean, that's one pointer to one particular paper that's causing a lot of buzz right now. And of, and of course, that could be used with a technique like this. So w when we have these um, effectively two-headed systems where you have uh, essentially a prediction of uh, the segmentation and the confidence, we're not really using too much more memory because we're sharing features basically all the way to the end. Uh, so. That would be my other point, is that we're not really making it any less memory efficient. And then the other point here is Jimmy Boss' work. Okay, one more question. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for the uh, very interesting talk. So um, uh, one problem with these architectures who try to predict uh, the confidence uh, directly during training is if they start to overfit. Because then they get completely overconfident, so this is at least my uh, experience. So uh, if you have not enough training, so, so I think you had uh, some examples where you had lots of training data and where you can really fit somehow uh, uh, a probability uh, to it. But as soon as the network starts to overfit, uh, uh, then, it, uh, yeah, then it always sees, okay, so I'm correct with my prediction, it gets completely overconfident, and as soon as you go to, uh, uh, to your uh, validation set or to the test set, you get uh, completely off uh, uh, values, and you can't even recalibrate this. Uh, so have you experienced the same? Uh 
We did. So we, we, we experienced that directly, and, and as we effectively have a couple of heuristics for taking care of that, and, that, and that's what I presented. So the, the first one is really maintaining sort of a, a constant level of uncertainty or, or, or target confidence, and that was really effective in essentially calibrating the confidence score so that it just really uh, didn't, didn't drastically change over the course of learning. Again, I, I've, I would like to see maybe we, we sort of integrate that more naturally into the framework and it becomes less of a heuristic, but it was a really effective, empirically it was an effective solution for us. And the, also the idea of doing stochastic uh, confidence estimates. So you're only, at any particular mini batch, you're only allowed to ask for hints from 50% from, uh, of them. That also has a, a similar effect on the, the, the dynamic of learning. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe very short, very brief. Very brief. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I missed one baseline, which is just taking an ensemble uh, uh, for estimating the confidence, because this was one that's quite an old paper already. Uh, so where, uh, uh, yeah, some of my colleagues showed that uh, these ensembles give the best uh, uh, confidence estimate. So yeah, and, and the MC dropout method is very much like an ensemble, right? You're just ensembling over basically the same <coughs> architecture family uh, with different dropout configurations, and, and effectively that's implementing a, a very efficient ensemble. Um, I, I agree with you that ensembling is another way that you can, uh, particularly across different architectures or different model classes, could be another way of, of, of ga gaining a confidence score. The downside is it's, um, you have to mul implement multiple ma methods, right? So sort of debugging that and implementing that is more no, uh, Just taxing. take the same, the same network. But yeah, we can yes. discuss And yes. less memory efficient and all those other things, right? All right, so uh, let's thank Graham again for his great talk.